OK, so we're going to look at how to describe regular polygons using polar coordinates. So we're essentially looking for an equation of the form r equals some function of theta, which will give us the radius or the distance from the centre to each of the points on our regular polygon. So here we've drawn a hexagon. We've got this set up so that when theta is zero, we should get the correct r value. And as theta goes round, r as our function of theta should give us all the different points on this hexagon. If we're going to solve this more generally, we'll actually do this for an n-sided polygon. So I'll start just by drawing a general picture for an n-sided polygon. So our first side of the polygon might look like this, then we continue round, we've got another side, we've got another side and so on, and it just keeps going round like this. So first of all, you might find something a bit strange about the setup is that we've chosen this so that the initial line when theta is zero is it's not on one of the vertices of our polygon, it's actually halfway along one of the sides. So it turns out this is going to make our calculations a little bit nicer rather than having the vertex at zero because we get a nice right angle triangle. Remember, we're looking to find r as a function of theta. So we'll start off first of all just by finding r as a function of theta on this first side or well, the top half of this side and then we'll generalize to the bottom half. Then we'll have a look at how we can extend this function so that we effectively get the same side repeating over and over as theta goes around. So for our general polygon, the first thing we can do is we're essentially going to try and find the equivalent of this length here, the horizontal length, which in this picture for the hexagon would tell us the value of r. So we're going to try and find, it will essentially be this length which goes halfway along and forms a right angle triangle in our general polygon. So we've got n sides, so this big angle here would be 360 degrees divided by n. We're going to work in radians though, so this will be 2 pi over n radians. So I'll copy out half of this triangle that we're going to work with. So we've got now, this is half of one of the sides, it's a right angle triangle. And this angle, rather than being 2 pi over n, it's only going to be half of that. It's going to be just pi over n. And we need to actually decide how big our polygon needs to be as well. So we'll actually just choose this so that all of our distances between the vertices and the centre of our polygon are one unit. So this just makes things nice here because then our hypotenuse is one. So let's try and find this length L here, we'll call it. We can just use some trigonometry here. Remember L is effectively the length we're interested in down there on the hexagon picture, but we're working more generally. So L, you can see cos pi over n is going to be equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, so you get cos pi over n is just L over 1, so L is equal to cos pi over n. So this is really useful now because I know this is the picture for the hexagon, but working more generally, the equivalent of this length then is always going to be cos pi over n. And we can use this to find the value of r in our picture. So you can see this is going to be valid for theta between 0 and pi over n, up to our first vertex there. So this will give us our polar equation for the n-sided polygon, at least for the top half of our first side. So you can, copying out this right angle triangle, you can see that r is the hypotenuse, we've got a right angle, an angle theta, and now we know that the adjacent is cos pi over n. So using some trigonometry again, cos theta is the adjacent cos pi over n divided by the hypotenuse r. So then just rearranging this, we get r is now going to be equal to cos pi over n divided by cos theta. And this is true for theta between 0 and pi over n. So what about the bottom half then of this first side? Well, we can actually use a nice argument by symmetry here. So if I copy out just a drawing of the first side, so these are our two vertices and this is the origin where r is 0. Let's copy in the horizontal, the line where theta equals 0 as well. So if you consider a point where the angle was theta here, and we could also consider a corresponding point theta going round clockwise from the initial line where theta was 0. So we could label this with a negative theta where the angle is the same. So you can see just by symmetry of our regular polygon that the r values should be the same for each of these. And this is where symmetry of the cosine function now becomes really useful because we know that cos theta is always equal to cos negative theta. So this tells us then that cos pi over n divided by cos theta, this is always going to be 
equivalent to the same thing but with a cos negative theta. So in fact we can just use the exact same function because putting in a negative value of theta we get the same r value whether theta is positive or negative. So this will give us repeats of all of our r values. So in fact we can say that r is going to be equal to cos pi over n over cos theta not just in this interval between 0 and pi over n, so this top half, but this will also be a valid formula for r in the bottom half of this first side. So this is true now, not just between 0 and pi over n, but between negative pi over n and positive pi over n. So we've managed to describe the first side of our n-sided polygon using polar coordinates, and now the challenging part is to somehow extend this function so that we can describe all of the other sides. So just to return to our sketch, we've got for theta between minus pi over n and positive pi over n, we've managed to describe this using a function which I'll call f theta. So this is for theta between minus pi over n and positive pi over n. So we've got an angle here of 2 pi over n. So now the idea is that if I were to draw in the next side and its corresponding triangle here, we get a repeat of this 2 pi over n angle. Let's consider a point here. Well, this point should have the exact same radius going to the centre as a corresponding point here if we were to take away 2 pi over n from the theta value for this angle. So the idea is that each of the points, if we were to take one further up here, this would have a corresponding point up here which would have the same radius. So every single point on this new side has a corresponding point on the previous side. We essentially want to take our function back 2 pi over n radians. So we'll turn this into f of theta minus 2 pi over n. So this value, we take away 2 pi over n, then we get the same r value as we would have for its corresponding point. If we wanted to add in the next side, of our polygon, so we just go around another 2 pi over n, we would replace, instead of having f of theta minus 2 pi over n, we'll now have f of theta minus 4 pi over n, and so on. So we could do this just breaking it up into small steps, doing it case by case for each side. This isn't very satisfying to have as our way of defining the functions. We want to have something a little bit more concise. So the idea, what we're looking for is we want f of theta minus 2 pi over n, this is where theta is between, it's between pi over n, starting at this point here, and then to the next vertex we go around another 2 pi over n, so between pi over n and 3 pi over n. So we're looking for this transformation of our function in this region, then we want f of theta minus 4 pi over n in the next interval, and then we'll have a look at the general case to give us a nice way of expressing this. So for f of theta minus, we'll call it 2k pi over n, where k is some positive integer, we want to have this subtracted away. This is where theta is between 2k minus 1 pi over n and 2k plus 1 times pi over n. So this should give us a way of describing our kth side as we go round and we'll have a look at how to actually achieve this, rather than having to split up into different cases and define our function f of theta piecewise. We'll find a neat way of doing this using the floor function now. So the idea is we want to use the floor function to somehow create a function where we put in a value of theta in this interval, then it will spit out 2k pi over n, this term we want to subtract from theta. You may notice here I've changed the interval just so we've got an open bracket at the end, so we exclude that point at the very end of the interval. This is just so that our intervals don't overlap, so it didn't really matter earlier because r is just equal to 1 at either end point, but this is just going to make things a little bit neater now. So one way of defining the floor function is you can say that a real number x is between k and k plus 1, excluding k plus 1, if and only if the floor function of x equals k, where k can be any integer here. So for example, 5.9, this would go down to 5 if you took the floor function of it. So this is going to be really useful because it's going to tell us what we need to put in the floor function so that we can get out a value of k, which will eventually multiply by 2 pi over n. 
So starting with this sort of argument, we have theta is in our interval of interest between 2k minus 1 pi over n and 2k plus 1 pi over n, excluding the n point on the right, so that's a square bracket. So this, if we just multiply everything by n and pi, we're going to try and simplify what's on the outside to get a k and k plus 1 on the right hand side. So multiply everything by n, divide everything by pi, you get n theta over pi is now between 2k minus 1 and 2k plus 1. So we're looking for an interval of width 1, but at the moment our interval has width 2, so let's divide everything by 2. So this is all true if and only if n theta over 2 pi is now between k minus a half and k plus a half. So now we just need to add a half to everything. So this is all true if and only if n theta over 2 pi plus 1 half is between k and k plus 1. But then using the definition of the floor function now, we started off with theta is in our interval of choice. This is true if and only if this thing is between k and k plus 1, which is true if and only if the floor function of this thing. So I'll write this plus half as just putting it all as one fraction, pi over 2 pi. So it's n theta plus pi over 2 pi is just our expression here. So this is between k and k plus 1, if and only if the floor function of it is equal to k. So this is telling us what we need to do to get our value of k. And this is also true if and only if. So if we now multiply by 2 pi over n, so 2 pi over n times the floor function of n theta plus pi all over 2 pi is equal to 2k pi over n. So now we've managed to, for any theta in our interval of choice, the floor function of this thing multiplied by 2 pi over n is now equal to our 2k pi over n term, which we wanted. So all that remains now is to actually subtract this from our theta. So we've got r is equal to cos pi over n divided by cos theta is our f theta. So now instead of dividing just by cos theta, which worked for our first side, we're going to divide by cos theta minus 2 pi over n times the floor function of n theta plus pi all over 2 pi. So then this is going to work. It's a bit strange that we started with theta is minus pi over n, then I guess we'll go round to 2 pi minus pi over n, but you can check actually that this would work for theta between 0 and 2 pi, or you could go between negative pi and positive pi, the function would just be 2 pi periodic. What I find really interesting about this is, regardless of your domain of definition, well, there's no reason we couldn't plug in a value of n now which actually isn't an integer. And I found what was really interesting for n is 2 and a half. What will happen is, let's imagine you've got your origin here where r is 0. So we would start off over here, and then we would get our first side, we would go around 1 over 2 and a half of the way around, so one, two and a half of a circle, we would end up somewhere over here. Then we'd go with another side, we'd perhaps end up around here. Then, because we've got two and a half, we only end up with two and a half sides. So this doesn't look very impressive, but the thing to do from here is we've gone from theta is zero around to theta is two pi. Why don't we keep going until we get to four pi? So we would continue going, we get another half a side here, then we get a whole side, and then finally we finish off with our fifth side. So we get two and a half sides per full revolution, but if we do two full revolutions, we actually get five sides, and we get this nice pentagram shape. So I've actually included a link in the description to something in Desmos you can have a play with if you're interested. Just experiment with some different non-integer values of n.